The purpose of this recording is to illustrate the scope of the Windrose Archive through brief excerpts from its films and projects. The Windrose Archive has two broad divisions, the Film Archive and the Project Archive. The Film Archive consists of old films of Dorset, Somerset and Wiltshire, discovered and saved with the help of local communities. The oldest films date from the 1910s, for example from Clevedon, Somerset in 1903, and Warminster, Wiltshire in 1909. Another of the early films portrays the great Sherborne pageant of 1905, created by Louis Napoleon Parker, which was the prototype for a far-reaching historical pageant movement that swept the country. The pageant film also illustrates some of the work that Windrose has done to tell the human stories behind old films, by creating full archive-based productions, adding the memories and knowledge of local people. At the first dress rehearsal, they had a thousand children and two thousand people as well who were unable even to pay for the cheapest of the tickets. All was now excitement in the town, the county and indeed further afield. For special trains were organised, cheap day fares returning the same day from the London and South Western Railway and also the Great Western Railway. Were there going to be great crowds? Was there going to be vandalism? Were they going to have teddy boys here brought in by these trains? Well, wow, wow, now we've got to be careful. Now we've got to protect ourselves. And so they brought in 70 additional police, 70 additional police in Sherborne, and some of them on horseback. Few on the farm are young, mostly old men left as the wimborne trees grow leaves again. These ghosts in lieu of a far-off fighting sun, they live for the time the cine takes to run. Other archive productions have included this film of Wimborne Market in 1945, made by a talented amateur for which Windrose commissioned music and a reflective poem by broadcaster and poet Sean Street. How times change, how implications grow. Without our hindsight, who could tell, who'd know? The boy who's bought a cockerel might be, but for a year's grace, killed by Germany. In and home again they come and go. Tradition's good, something is changing though. In, recalling days from other springs, in from Blandford, past Badbury rings, from Verwood, Alderholt, Corfmullen, and Hamlets between, a pattern on the land. Derek Pike is the only person still living in the village who descends from someone who had a prominent part in the 1918 film. I'm standing at the top of Euron Hill. Urine itself lies about a mile down the road. It's in these cottages over here that my grandfather used to live in the early 1900s. My grandfather was Mr. Sprackland, who was shepherd for Mr. Ismay, and appeared in the film that he made on Urine. With this film of Ewan Minster, a small Dorset village, at the end of the First World War in 1918, Windrose has told the story of James Ismay, brother of Bruce Ismay of Titanic infamy, who as an enlightened lord of the manor struggled to hold his community together despite the loss of Ewan men to the conflict in France. On Monday the 15th, Salisbury Sheep Fair took place. Sprackland and all of us thought we should bring back the cup to Ewan for the best pen of ram lambs. But the quality of the ram lambs shown was so good that we had to be content with the second prize.
In Salisbury and South Wiltshire, a wide range of films has been combined with local memories and reflections to create a production which provides an insight into the history of work, community life, environmental change and fun. It was such an interesting fair because there were so many different stores and uh, you never quite knew who was going to turn up and there were these rather um, weird things with um, um, you know, Siamese babies and things uh, in, in big glass jars. There used to be the funny little people, little dwarfs and the bearded lady and those sort of people. We used to think it was high fun to go look at them. The trouble is that most of these archive productions, created many years ago on pre-digital formats, have long been unavailable. We've been able to assemble excerpts for this presentation through voluntary effort. But, as with the whole archive, much work is needed to revive them properly. The archive is almost entirely made up of material that doesn't exist anywhere else, including the only known animation by Heath Robinson. There are amateur and professional records of work and trades, such as these scenes at West Bay in the 1930s. A complete farming year filmed in colour, ironically on German film stock, near Corfe Castle in 1942. Derek, he was a uh, half German and he didn't want to fight. So uh, he was told that instead of fighting or doing anything like that, he had to work for three days on a farm. So having been at school with Howard, he came and asked him if he would let him work on the farm. And so he did, and he used to come over and bring his camp bed and cook his own food on a stove. And of course he had this thing, he's a keen photographer, you see, and he used to always have his camera on board and, and he could always have an eye for a picture, I suppose, and he used to go round all the time, all the farm work, and it made a wonderful film in the end. a 1917 portrait of the Crossroads Pottery in Verwood. And the village and farm of forward-looking landowner and conservationist Hamilton Rivers Pollock at Urchfont in 1937. Some of the most telling films are portraits of everyday community life, like these scenes in Compton Martin in the 1940s. And from the same period, the Volunteer Fire Brigade, practising in Winscombe and Axbridge. There is much more. Folk customs, the Minehead Hobby Hoss, 
filmed in 1916. Oak Apple Day at Wishford in the 1950s. The Salisbury Giant in the 1920s. As soon as the southbound train leaves Bath, it begins a long climb over the Mendips on gradients of up to 1 in 50. Transport, the famous Somerset and Dorset Railway just before closure in 1966. Education, for example, the specialised Adcroft School of Building in Trowbridge in the 1950s. Holidays, as here at Swanage in the 1930s. Or entertainment such as this performance of Yeovil Amateur Operatic Society at the town's Octagon Theatre in 1976. That footage was used during a partnership with the Octagon Theatre, the Operatic Society and a local school which illustrates the second aspect of the Windrose Archive, the Project Archive. The youth theatre was great. It was a place where you know, kids could go and learn about music, learn about acting. And it was during my time in the youth theatre that I realised that I really, really wanted to do it. You know, I didn't want to just do it once a year. I wanted to do it all the time. I like the island Manhattan. In this case, Windrose was exploring the history of entertainment in Yeovil over the last 100 years, through oral history interviews, old film and research, culminating in an on-stage show, combining all of these elements with live song and narration. I'm Jack Sweet, local historian. I'm standing in Princess Street just outside the old assembly rooms, Yeovil's main entertainment centre from about 1890 until the early 1960s. Everything happened here, dances, concerts. This was really Yeovil's prime entertainment centre. 
until, of course, the Johnson Hall came on the scene. The fire started very quickly, and by the time the fire brigade got there, it was, the town hall was well and truly on fire. I'm standing on the site of the old town hall. It was destroyed by fire on September the 22nd, 1935. Windrose has itself recorded vital moments in local history, such as the closure of Sturminster Newton Market, almost the last livestock market in Dorset. Very sad day for Sturminster, very sad day for Dorset. Um, end of a tradition which has been going on for such a long time. Um, end of an era, really. Very, very sad day, not only for Sturminster Newton, but for the whole community of Dorset. Not just farmers, you see, it's everyone, you know, it's people that have moved in here to retire and the uh, young parents like to bring the children to see the animals and it's a way of life as well, isn't it, for we farmers. Yeah, mm. sad, sad day. It's going to take a week or two to get used to not coming in here on a Monday, really. Um, woke up this morning and said, well, I better go into Sturminster for the last time. And it is going to be strange to find something to do on a Monday. I think next Monday I may even come in, um, just to finally lay the ghost to rest. Gutted is the word, I suppose, gutted. Love the place. I mean, this is where I serve all my friends, not just customers, but friends. I mean, I can't measure what I shall feel like. A sense of deep sadness and loss, but frustration, I think, really, that nobody anywhere seems to stretch out a hand they want to say, we'll help you. Money talks, as you know, and money has talked in this case. Everybody wants to grab it. The project archive includes the fruits of many audio projects, with a strong emphasis on oral history and sound portraits of ways of life. Many of these gave young people the opportunity to learn how to make radio programmes and achieved BBC broadcasts. Some have been cross-generational. I've had 10 years on Steam. Uh, June 10th, 1967 is when they done away with Steam. What did you like about working on the Steam trains? It was a different atmosphere than the day. You had one mate, and if you had a good mate, it was a good job. It was hard work, but it was a good job. Totally different today, which is boring in my estimation. You know, it's not in the same street. Morning. Hi, can I have uh, David Jones London, please? Mm -hmm. Okay, did you want to clear the underground on that at all? Uh, no. No? Okay. That's 24.30 then, please. Thank you. Any fence change on your uh, ticket? So I need, um the next train to arrive at the platform will be the 1011 Southwest train service to Paynton. This train will call at Gillingham, Templecombe, Sherbourne, Yeovil Junction. The train's now approaching. I'm now leaving the ticket office in order to carry out the train dispatch, which will entail me waiting for the train to come to a stand. When the doors are open, we'll make sure that everybody's on, everybody's off. I will then give a signal to the guard that station work is finished and when the doors are closed again we'll watch the orange indicators on the side of the coaches to make sure the doors are closed properly and I'll give a guard the second tip that's with this pattern for the train to dispatch. All right, I'm just walking up the conductor. Good morning young man, how are you this morning? You're not normally as quiet as this. Did you have to learn to um, drive tractors? Yes, I did learn about tractor and all that, you know, while I was training. And um, I, I learnt everything. I went up the Mendips haymaking, 
and uh, Mary and I was sort of loading it onto the tractor. The men were standing it to us on pitchforks and we had to take it off the pitchforks and sort of layer it out till it was quite high. And then I said to Mary, how did we get off? I forgot. And we had to slide down. <laughs> I, I, I still can't believe it, but we did. I can remember now. We did. Mary said, we used to have to slide down. I said, oh, yes, yeah, so we did. And it was such hot weather, and it was quite high, and then they, then we had to slide down, and then they take the, it off somewhere, I suppose, made the out rick with it, and then brought it back, so we had a bit of time in between. And they were giving us cider in between, <laughs> and at the end of the day... Uh, so, so that, that was really, you know. What's the difference in how the sheep fairs run now? To me, it's not run as well, but then I'm a bit biased and the 12 shareholders couldn't possibly run it in the present day as it involves too many people. Years ago, it was just um, the local farmers and local people that used to come, so it was very small, but now it's got so big that it does need to be run how it is run, but it's not the same as how it used to be. Do you think the sheep fairs lost some of its tradition by not having the shareholders run it? Yes, I definitely think it it has. Um, it's difficult to put into words, and I don't want to upset the people who run it, because they do a very good job. It was much more of a family affair, um, but people come from so far away now, and there's different stalls... All we had were a few along the green that was sort of farming equipment and clothes, whereas today it's totally different stores. All the stores are different. They're more like a town, a town fair instead of a how we used to know it as country people. Hello, you are back with Joseph Smith with the Saxons and the Vikings. The Vikings are currently being marched up Ridgeway Hill by the Saxons ready to be executed in some way or another. The axe has been thrown down from the chief Saxon and now his sword has been drawn. The new victim is kneeling. The sword has been brought into his neck, but his head is not being sawn. It was many attempts before the heads came away from the body. The final Viking is screaming. So far, 53 Vikings have been killed. And the last one is falling. And now they're all dead. The killing is over and now in front of me are 54 bodies and 54 heads all separate. The Battle of Ridgeway Hill is officially over and the Saxons are victorious over the Vikings. And the heads of the defeated Vikings are being held high. Saxon victory! Saxon victory! Saxon victory! Now the Vikings have been left in the pit to rot away for years. This is Joseph Smith reporting the massacre of Widray Hill signing off. Village groups have been trained in making oral history records of their own communities. I remember one particularly, although I won't mention any names, who got pregnant. She was only 15 and... uh, she tried to drain herself and then changed her mind and went to Nurse Wells. And Nurse Wells took her in, uh, saw her, delivered her baby and kept her for seven weeks and got a lot of the locals to give everybody brought clothes for the baby. When the gypsies had a particularly difficult confinement and they were camped near Mere, they would send for Nurse Wells with a donkey. She would ride the donkey up no Path, which is up over the Downs, across the Roman road to where they were camped, deliver the baby, have a cup of tea and a chat, and come back home again on the donkey. Other village groups have been trained and mentored in making their own community videos as a permanent record of a moment in their local history. I was thinking coming down the road, Gilbert, of all the sausages your father used to make. We wouldn't have had this choice then, would we? That's right. There's one we wouldn't sell now that we did then, in wartime, was 
whale meat sausages. Really? And even with the shortage of meat, yes. nobody would eat them. Wouldn't they? <laughs> 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 what is it? Dodge you dodge from school today, is it? Yes. It is. <laughs> Waterkeeper Archie Barrett. Well, we've heard about water lords. Can you please tell us what they are? Water lords? Well, it was an, a very old uh, name for the lord of the manor. And, like, from Marlborough, you'd have the uh, Marcus of Aylesbury. He owned it right down to Stitchcombe. And then you had the Burdett estate, which was for Francis Burdett. And he owned it from Stitchcombe right to the Lidicott boundary, which is at night. Then from there on was Sir Ernest Wills at Lidicott. He owned it then right down to the, what we call the Chilton Bridge. And then the Ward Estate, they owned it from there to Ungerford. Now, they had total control of all the water in that area, those few men. And they, so each one had his own keepers, not keeper, keepers then. And uh, should one let any weed or rubbish go down onto the other one, he would have been in trouble. Musicians and poets have been given the opportunity to respond creatively to local history, as in these radio ballads about the stone miners of Purbeck and the railwaymen in the Age of Steam. Well, I think it's like a memorial to the old quarrymen, isn't it? really I mean all these shafts are getting what well, they are practically all filled up and there's rubbish chucked down them and soon they say uh, quarrymen worked underground I don't believe that they always dug it from the top and, and unless you've got a quarry or unless there is a quarry you can't uh, tell them no difference Right, now we come back here. We've got used to it a little bit. A lot of these quarrymen worked on their own. And they stay down here, what, eight, nine, ten hours on their own. And they do a lot of work that's quite dangerous. So when he worked out here on his own, another pair of eyes was a thing like that, was an enamel mug. You will see like enamel mugs and plates and all that put in there. And if he's trying to get that metal in that end and some it moves up here you wear the enamel plink you know how it plicks off the plates and that and that was saying that well that's moving you know you've got to keep your eye on that and in some places there's little bits of glass put in that uh, that is another good warning that something's moving but it is a dangerous job when you take stones out the ceiling like that and you're actually on your own you know I think we'll have a couple of more candles and I'll put in my pocket in case we should drop these or... had a mate and, and but right at the end I had a driver I had him really for four years I didn't work with him every day I must admit and I knew no more about him when I left him than I did the day I went with him and he was the most awkward cussed person you could ever wish to work with but having come out of the army I, that was no problem <laughs> he had an attitude I said to him one day Jack why didn't you why didn't you ever get married he said because I want my own way and I'm gonna have it when you were with me, you remember, you're the fireman. <laughs> and that was it. But apart from that, he was a superb engine man. Absolutely superb. I learned a lot from him just by watching. He'd got no kids and he'd got no wife. Got Get no it wrong and he'd give you strife. A right old codger was Driver Jones, with fire in his belly and iron in his bones. 
but he knew his locomotive, and he loved her. He'd take no excuses, you'd give no lip, you'd learn your bloody lessons without a slip. An evil man was Driver Jones, with fire in his belly and iron in his bones. But he knew his locomotive, and he loved her. The spark in his eye burned hot as coal, what ran in his veins wasn't blood but oil. A hard, hard man was Driver Jones, with fire in his belly and iron in his bones. But he knew his locomotive, and he loved her. When you look back down the track of the years, it's codgers like Jones that light up your fears. He taught you the job, he made you a man. He'd skill in his hand and oil in his can, and he knew his locomotive, and he loved her. Now he's long gone, grown old and retired. His fire's been dropped that once inspired. A wise Strong man was Driver Jones, with fire in his belly and iron in his bones, and he knew his locomotive, and he loved her. Another project gave people aged from 13 to 75 the chance to write their own radio plays on local themes. They worked under the guidance of a Radio 4 playwright, and the plays were recorded on location, with casts combining amateurs and professionals working unpaid. Several were broadcast by BBC stations. He thought this was coming for a long time, longer than I realised. And there's something else. What's that? That's why he didn't want children. He said that? The other night. Said he couldn't bear the thought of it being in their blood and them not having the chance at farming. I thought we were just putting it off till we were a bit more secure. <laughs> Imagine that, a farmer who's secure. <laughs> yeah, not these days. Not unless you've got a few thousand acres. And then it all got too late. Said all he'd have to pass on to them would be the horseshoe collection. But not the land they were found in. That's what brought it home to him, those horseshoes. Continuity. Not anymore. And it's as if he's grieving for it. It will be a struggle for him. It's the routine as much as anything. I've been able to take slow steps away from it. And that was hard enough. But his path has been barred to him. Uh, yes, I've enjoyed my life. I wouldn't have changed it for anything else in the world. Most farmers my age couldn't do anything else. I couldn't do anything else, apart from a bit of building, still build a wall or anything like that, but I couldn't do anything else. And a lot of the young farmers, re well, they haven't re they're not retiring. They've just got to give up because they're running out of money. I can name at least six now that's just got to give up in their 50s, which is very, very sad. You just can't kick the mud off your boots. It's a crazy situation. You can't. I know farmers are losing a lot of money, but they can't stop. They cannot stop. It's as if your body would do it anyway. Gets ingrained in the bones. Milking, hoeing, haymaking. And market day every Monday. And I don't think he's missed once since he was seven. When I was a lad, my father used to say, <laughs> But tis a school day, John. Not Mondays, Dad. Don't you remember? Well, I, I suppose it's educational. Best there is for a farmer. But by now, it was taken for granted. Son. What's wrong with her, Dad? Oh, milk fever. Will she die? Oh, not if the vet gets here smartish. Mm. He's on his way. Will the calf be okay? Oh, she'll live all right. You go on to the market. See what's to. I'll be down later. Go on now, I'll be fine. Many thousands of people have been attracted to Windrose's 209 archive film shows, the majority held in village halls in partnership with local groups. The appeal of archive film has become even more potent when combined with live performances of traditional music from the area and storytelling. 
A series of shows with these elements has toured theatres and art centres. We saw fields filled with life. So many worked on the land. There was pasture full of herbs and flowers, small family farms mixing animals and crops. Cows were fed on grass, not grain or bits of other beasts. There were good employers and bad ones, poverty and hard graft. But everyone worked with mates. They were not alone. In my youth, these were people who sang, sang of their own lives, sang of their inheritance. So early one morning, just by the brink of the day, the cocks was a Other shows have interlaced archive films with live on-stage interviews, featuring local people with memories and historical knowledge to share. These interviews have themselves been recorded as oral history archive. <laughs> and then also we supplemented it during the winter, which I haven't said to you, is with beachcombing, which is an art. As my mate who's here will tell you, you're a West Bay boy. If I walked past the penny on the floor now, I would see it, even in the dark here. And so would he. <laughs> and you'd fight and over that's it. That's a West Bay boy, you call that, because you, you actually, you've got the ability to do it. Because you see them walking on with their heads down, they're always looking. And when they used to roll about on the beach, the couples and that, you know, up to whatever, we used to hope that the money fell out their pockets. And, grab all them. <laughs> and then we could go and pick it up in the winter, you know. From the early 1980s, Windrose has made a series of its own original productions about rural life and community initiatives. These are themselves now history and overdue for revival. One followed the Wilton and District Youth Band, an amazing institution which enriched the lives of a huge number of young village people as it struggled to raise the means to tour in America. And, and the age of them now, I mean a lot of them are at exam stages. And it really does take up a lot of their time, doesn't it? I don't know how they do do it, actually. Do you? No. How they keep they up the pressure? They make it so easy. I think sometimes it would be lovely to be part of it. But they enjoy it so much. I'm very proud of them when they go out and play at all the different functions and that. Especially, you know, when we've just come back from Luxembourg. It was fantastic to see all these young musicians. And the way they were greeted, it was fantastic, wasn't it? They played at an old people's home, didn't they? And, and they said that was a favourite concert they did, yeah. they loved it. The, the old people were so taken up. One old man was really in tears, wasn't he? And it was it's fantastic. It's good for the children to do things for other people. There was no band. I don't know really. It might, my life might be completely different. I mean, I might be a completely different person without the band. I don't know why. I just might. Another recorded the practice of willow growing and processing on the Somerset Moors, including a yard which is now gone. We start in the morning. First thing we do is come down, clean the asses out, light the boiler up, and we fill them up the willows. You've got to keep me going all the time. You're about every hour you've got to put coal in. We're not hardly really up to date with the modern ones where they put all, you know, got it all oil heated. We're still doing it the old fashioned way. And then we carry on then and kept keeping boiling for eight hours. If it's late, if he hadn't done his time before five o'clock, we've got to come back afterwards and keep him boiling until we done our time. 
amongst many others, was a production which explored the success of an intelligent and hugely persistent campaign by a small community to persuade British Rail to reopen Templecombe Station after 16 years of closure. It was a great occasion, really. I mean, it, it really demonstrated the absolute enthusiasm for the railway station of, of the villages around uh, uh, Templecombe and the other villages around. Uh, it, it was fantastic. I mean, there was so much uh, enthusiasm and so many people there. Uh, I don't think uh, you could expect a better reception for anything that we've done, really, especially in such a small community. It really was a, a very good uh, day. It needed the enthusiasm of the local community to say, we want it opened, uh, we want to support it, whether it's going to market in Salisbury, or whether it's an old age pensioners outing, or whatever the need was. I don't think it could have been achieved by officialdom at all, quite frankly. It relies for its success almost entirely on the general spirit that was generated in the community. Uh, we, and British Rail, if it comes to that, I think, were carried along by that enthusiasm. Uh, in a reasonably modest sort of way, but we were able to oil the wheels and, and, and smooth the path, if I could put it that way. What would you say to other people who might be contemplating trying to get their village stations reopened? Well, it's um, think long and hard about it, and it's not the sort of thing you can get into half-hearted. If you're not 100% into it and willing to put an all-out effort into it, it's, it's just not worth starting. You've got to be really determined and persevere. There's no other way of doing it. You've really got to keep on. Although not yet fully part of history, Windrose has also developed a project to create some of tomorrow's archive in a considered way and to encourage others to do the same. Palmer's is a company that one has been here a very long time. We've got 54 pubs in, in Dorset, Somerset, Devon, so we're known for our pubs. The company was formed in 1794 by the Gundry family. The Palmer's family bought the company in 1896 and it's still run by John and Cleves Palmer. John's our chairman and managing director and Cleves our sales and marketing director. I joined the brewery 20 years ago um, as a very um, young, naive biology graduate. I decided that um, if it paid me enough money and they trained me, I would stay, and 20 years later I'm head brewer. I'm practically, during the day, looking at all of the parameters during the brewing process. They may be temperature, they may be timings, they may be volumes making sure we're hitting the specifications so we're consistent from brew to brew. We need to have the same starting point for fermentation, we need to make sure the fermentations are running consistently and the beer is of the right strength and quality at the end of the seven day fermentation. Those things you just cannot get wrong. We've just taken a sample off the boil. What we have to do through the process is make sure we've got the right work density or the right gravity. So we tip the, the wort into a, a cooler and we cool the, the sample down to a known temperature and, and then we put a psychrometer in and we just measure the density of that solution. We do these checks all the way through the brewing process. The film, video and audio material shown here is mostly from that part of the archive that is in use for current or recent Windrose work and hence accessible, or has been assembled through unpaid work for the HLF application. The great majority of the archive remains on pre-digital formats, unused and unavailable to the public. With funding, however, the archive can become a great resource for many people and many purposes.